Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. All right, all right. Hey, go ahead and take a seat. Uh, thank you, Justin. Hey, let's give them a hand for leading us so well. Awesome. So good. And I am so glad to be here today with y'all. I'm glad to be anywhere today. Uh, no kidding. I've had people, I didn't think so much in the moment, but I've had people say, man, could have been a lot worse. Uh, I could have been killed. Um, and if you don't know, um, actually jumped out of a plane and survived without a parachute. Um, just broke a couple bones and that was it. No, I, um, yeah, I was hit about six weeks ago almost. I was on my bike worshiping the Lord like I do, having a blast, and I got hit by a car. And um, so a few bones broken in the ankle, and uh, evidently all of the bones that actually um, let your foot stay where it's supposed to be. And, uh, and then a hairline fracture up here on the fibula. So, but I'll, but, so the cringe factor will, will be way down. I'm not in any pain at all. In fact, the doctor has given me um, this week, told me I can put weight on it. So I'm just, yeah, thank you. So um, I'm killing it, right? Uh, and it's so good to be with you. And thank you, church family, again. So many cards and notes. I mean, I think hundreds, lots of food and uh, Stacy was so well cared for, and I just, if I talk too long about it, I'll get emotional because of the way y'all have loved us and cared for us. It's just been awesome. I'm so thankful to be your pastor, and uh, I love you so much. Our family loves you so much, and we're so grateful. And what a great summer it's been thus far. Uh, I hated that I missed out a bit on VBS, but uh, it was incredible. And all of you who had a part of that, way to go. And uh, we finished... Um, we, we, we actually uh, are now entering into a new ministry plan on July 1st, by the way. So just want to encourage you, church family, uh, to finish strong in terms of your giving. Our fiscal year ends at the end of June. So let's be faithful in these days. Some of you give you know, in, in, the, in the moment here in the worship service, but others of you give online. I want to encourage, uh, encourage you to do that and, uh, and give. So now's a good time to pray and to seek the Lord so we can finish strong. We're walking through this series of, of messages in the Psalms, and I hope that you're... you're um, Reading the book of Psalms with us. Uh, I'm in, our whole family, we're all in. Walking through the Psalms together makes this such a more powerful time and that, that God is speaking His Word into our lives. So you have a bookmark, you can go online and find it. But if you haven't uh, been doing that, catch up with us. And I'd say this too, way to go dads here on Father's Day. Um, way to go. I mean, we've got a packed house. And generally, sadly, typically in the church uh, uh, across the board, um, in America, Father's Day is actually down. Mother's Day is always up. Uh, Father's Day, uh, not so much. And so way to go, dads. Way to be here. And uh, so thankful, so grateful. We're going to be looking, uh, you know, at the most famous of all the Psalms, and it's Psalm 23. So if you want to turn there, um, I'm going to walk us through this Psalm, this, this very popular, well-known Psalm. So everybody turn there. If you have a you know, your phone, if it won't distract you too much uh, to go elsewhere, uh, you can do that. If you have a Bible there in front of you, always bring the Bible. You know, bring this, this text is the text for this course, always. So bring your Bible. It's what we look at. Uh, I've got nothing to say, by the way, but the Word of God has much to say uh, that will transform your life. And what I want to talk about today, we'll get there in a moment. I want to set this up a bit. Um, I want to talk about this, this word trust. The single word that I want us to focus on today is trust. What is trust? I think we throw words around like that, like faith. We throw, throw that around. Oh, I have faith in this or that. Uh, I can say that trust is faith, or you could even say maybe more clearly, faith is trust. When, to say you have faith in something means that you place your trust in it. And wherever you place, whomever you place your trust in becomes your functional God. Meaning you can say that God is your God, but if you don't place your trust in Him, it's just words. And so what's going to happen here? David teaches us in this psalm how and why we can trust God, the good shepherd. And so this thing of 
trust. You see, here's the thing. If you don't trust in God, it's not that you don't trust in anything then. Oh, I trust in nothing. I don't believe in God. I trust in nothing. No, no, no. You trust in something. Everyone trusts in something. You could say it this way. Everyone places faith in something or someone. And if it's not God, it's something or someone else. And this is so important to understand because we all are either worshiping God or we're placing our trust in other things. Uh, it's interesting. Just this week, there was a, uh, yet another research uh, study done, Vanderbilt University, that said that people who go to church regularly, regular church attendance, decreases stress and physical ailments and health issues, and it also extends life. Now, we know that biblically, we know that that's the case, uh, that, that you're going to have a healthier life if you start with spiritual health, right? Because all, not all, but a lot of anxiety, health issues, and challenges that we face begin with an unhealthy spiritual life. Or how about this? Uh, an inability or desire to trust God with your life because you're trusting in something else. Now, of course, I step back from that and I think, why is that the case? Think about it. If you're not constantly reminded, how about this, constantly among God's people, as you are today, why our gatherings are so critical, in relationship with others, in the Word, you don't know what to do with guilt. Guilt will eat you alive. You don't know what to do with failure. You cannot live forgiven, right? You're never content. You're always seeking, trusting in something that will fail you. And the older I get, the more I realize, wherever I place my trust Whatever idols I have, whatever false gods I, I tend to run to, they will fail me every time. Over time, they will fail you. God alone is the one you can trust who will not fail you ever. That's why the person who attends church regularly, or I could say is involved in the local church, connected with other believers, seeking to understand his word and grow daily, that person understands what it is to live in the rest of and in peace with God and with others. And that's what this psalm is all about. The opposite of trust, of course, would be distrust. The opposite of anxiety and stress would be uh, dis-ease and, uh, and challenge, right? If it, I mean, the opposite of stress would be rest and trust. And so what we see here in this psalm is how we can trust the Lord, Okay. So let's, let's think about this for a moment. Uh, here's one, when I read this, uh, this is fantastic word for fathers, by the way. And it's also a word about how to manage or handle anxiety and stress in our lives. Mass confession. How many of us wrestle with stress in our lives at some level, anxiety and worry at some level in our lives? All right? All right. Okay, good. Those of you who didn't raise your hand need to be stressed about your you're lying. I mean, there should, <laughs> should be something you should confess and bring to the Lord um, because we all, we all wrestle with stress. But here's what's really cool about this passage is that we look at the good shepherd and dads, listen, if you will, will allow the good shepherd to shepherd your life and to bring uh, into your life this, this, this rest that he brings because he provides for you, he protects you. If you can lead your family in the same way by providing, by protecting and you're going you're gonna to be able to fulfill the role that you have as a father. This is true of every man, whether you're a father or not. Men have been designed to provide and protect. This is what we're going to see today from the Good Shepherd. So studies show that chronic stress is on the rise. And I can tell you that as a pastor, it's what I'm seeing more and more. I talk to young men uh, in their 30s and 40s in particular. I talk to women as well. But I'm meeting with men and their number one challenge in their lives is anxiety and stress. And I'm seeing it on the rise. I think there's a lot of reasons for this. I think one is we have more to worry about in our day. Uh, I really do. Some of you who are younger, uh, it's true. Uh, things were simpler back in the day. I think hurry is another reason that we, we, we are stressed. Um, someone said that the epitaph for our generation will be hurried, worried, buried. Carl Jung is the one who said that hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. John Ortberg, one of my favorite pastors, writers, he was talking to his uh, spiritual mentor, Dallas Willard. And he asked uh, Dallas, he said, how can I maintain a vibrant, healthy, spiritual life? 
as I seek to shepherd and pastor people. Dallas Willard says, well, I tell you what, you've got to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And Ortberg said, oh, man, that's good. I'm going to write that down. That's excellent. What else? And Dallas paused for a long time, and he said, there is nothing else. That's it. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. I've learned this, and actually in my life, when I slow down and listen to God, he speaks to me. When I don't, he doesn't. Have you figured that out yet? So we got worry. We hurry. Another reason, I think, is crowds. Think about this. Uh, In 1800, there was one city in the world that had more than a million people. Can you guess where that was? 1800. It was London. Now there are over 500 metropolitan areas across the globe that have more than a million people. There are 100 cities in China alone that have more than a million people. And if you live close enough here to come to this service in Dallas, you're in crowds all the time. Go to a city like Mumbai, Sao Paulo, go to Tokyo, 37 million people. You can go for miles and be in crowds. That can create stress in our lives. It can be that sense of hurry. If you've ever been to a place like New York City, immediately you enter into the city and you're just like, I gotta walk faster. I gotta keep up with these people. I gotta walk. You know, you just sense it, right? This anxiety level rises, and I think a lot of us live that way. I think in others, multiple choices we have. For some, we say, I love having multiple choices. It can be paralyzing. It can be stressful. What insurance company do I go to? What, 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 what bankers? Should I, who do I trust? Who do I not? Back in the day, friends, listen, there was one bar of soap. Uh, uh, soap. I need soap. Right? I mean, you can go to Starbucks now. Kids, back in the day, go to a diner, cup of coffee. Thank you. <laughs> um, cream and sugar, maybe. 80,000 possibilities at Starbucks. Alone. That can create stress and anxiety. That's just one picture of that. But across the board, I think loss of privacy, any loss creates stress and anxiety in our lives. But loss of privacy, that's something that we didn't have to deal with in in former generations. Pluralism creates stress. That is, we live now among people, and the internet has shrunk the world. We live among people who don't think like we do, don't have the same values. They don't look like us. Creates stress. We've said it in the church, diversity is God's plan. God loves diversity. Because diversity is where grace shows up, but it can create stress in our lives. Is anybody, are you stressed? Have I got you there? Anybody stressed? <laughs> the other is fear of the future. We're afraid. We're not going to have enough, or we're afraid of our health failing us. We're afraid that our children aren't going aren't gonna to make it, or they're going to they're gonna move off, and they're going to not, not live around here anymore. We don't know what's going to happen, Right? We're fearful, and and so this is why this psalm is so critical for us to understand. In Matthew 6, Jesus told us, don't worry about anything. And then Paul tells us, right, in in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing. How many of us live that way? That's a command. Don't worry about anything. And if you're like me, you go, well, yeah, but Lord, let me just, hold on. Let me just give you my list. Let me just tell you, this is why I'm worried. This is why I'm anxious. Ang- and he would say, nope, I got this. What does it mean that he's got this? How do you live like this? David tells us. So you have it open there. Here's two things I want you to see today. God can be trusted because he provides for us. That's the first. You've heard me say it. Secondly, and, and shorter, we're going to spend more time on the first. Secondly, he protects us. Dads, this is your role in the family. Listen, provision, protection. Pro means before, ahead of time. Vision, of course, means to see. Dads see ahead of time what their family needs. Dads see ahead of time what his infant child will need when he's in preschool. He knows what the middle schooler is going to need when he gets to the senior year of high school. He knows what he's going to need when he heads off to school. When she goes off to college, off into the world, dad sees ahead of time. Dad protects. Now that word, again, before, tech essentially comes from a Latin word that means uh, a covering over. Dad is ahead of his family, seeing what they need ahead of time. He's ahead of his family, protecting them before they get there. Think of all the things that dads need to protect their children from in these days. So this is a powerful message, not only for dads, but for all men. 
Dads and men are designed to offer provision and protection, and that's what our good shepherd does here. So look at this. God can be trusted because, real simple again, two things, but I want to unpack each one. He provides for us. Look at what David says. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I love, I love his uh, kind of the personal pronoun. He's my shepherd. I've got a sense that David, think about this. Did he write this when as he was a shepherd? Perhaps. He wrote songs while he was a shepherd. Or is this later? He's looking back and thinking back when he was a shepherd. Uh, in their day, in fact, any place you would look out, if you're on a, on a hill anywhere, it would happen right now. If we were in Palestine, you could look out in any direction and you would see shepherds and sheep right now. I mean, I mean while he's writing this back in the day. And, and uh, it was very common. So it could have been that he was just seeing a group of shepherds, but he's thinking about himself as a shepherd. And I have a hunch, he's looking out and he says, man, I wish I was, I was a sheep. Think about it. Stacy and I, we have a new puppy in our house. Um, don't judge. Don't judge us. Uh, an incredible little puppy. She's a golden doodle and her name is Gypsy because she's a free-spirited wanderer, adventurer. <laughs> um, and uh, she has brought so much joy in our lives. I wish I was Gypsy. I mean, really? Like, where's my food at? Right? I'm going to lay down on the floor right here. I took a nap five minutes ago. I'm going to take another nap. <laughs> I'm going to play. Where are you taking me now? Awesome. You know, I mean, she has no cares in the world, right? Um, and if you want to see, probably on social media, way too many pictures of her in the days to come. You can, you can follow me. But... Um, but, uh, and she doesn't have her own, by the way, her own, her own uh, Instagram or something yet, but uh, not yet. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking, he's thinking, man, if I were just a sheep, because the sheep, and he knows as a shepherd, the sheep has everything taken care of for him, for it, for her. And he's saying, I have the Lord as my shepherd. And the language here is such, I don't need a thing. I love that. We could just rest there for a while. Verse 1. And the language is such, really, he's saying, I don't want a thing. I think David's makes it, making a distinction between his needs and his wants. We often think we want more. God, the good shepherd, knows what we need more than we do. He trusts the good shepherd. Are you trusting the good shepherd? He looks to the shepherd for everything he needs. See, and, and when you trust him, we stop looking at other people to fulfill our needs, uh, and we look to him alone. To fulfill our needs. He alone is trustworthy and true. Stop looking to other people to meet your needs. If you were to do this today, truly live it out, you would enter into a place of new rest and peace in your life. Too many of us place our security and identity in something we may lose. How crazy is that? Not everybody's going to like you. You're not always going to look like you look. Your health will fail you. You can lose your job. You can lose your spouse. You can lose your children. You can lose your mind. But if you have God as your good shepherd, you will never lose all that matters in your life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And as we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, Romans 8, 23 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. See, I must look to God to provide all of my needs. And as I receive Christ, he becomes in the portal into every good gift that I need in my life. My identity is secure. I'm forgiven. I am content. I have eternal life. The worst thing that can come to me is that I may lose my life, and that is not the worst thing by a long shot as I enter into eternity. So he provides for us. What does he provide? Okay, look at this. He provides rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, he makes me. Isn't that interesting? Now, you can say, well, did God, I've, I've thought about it. God, did you make me lie down in recent days? I would say yes. I think so. Now, you may wonder about that kind of theology, but I think God is sovereign over all things. He truly is. Let me ask you this. Why, is it, why do you faint? Why do people faint? Because God wants you to get horizontal. You need blood rushing to your, to your head. You need oxygen in the brain, right? So you faint. It's God's way of just kind of going, you know, bam, now you're going to be better, right? 
And I think God makes us lie down because we're designed, we're wired to obey him. That's why we have the Sabbath. Let me just give you permission. In fact, in fact honor all dads. Here's an application of the message. Go home and take a nap. <laughs> Go and take a nap and worship him while you do. See, the, the, here's what's going on here. The language is not that he forces you, though I think sometimes God does. It's more like making a, a bed. He creates a scenario within your soul, within your heart, that you're going to lay down, you're going to take time off, and you're going to worship him, knowing that he's in control of all things. Why do we not rest? Because we've got to be in control, right? Instead of trusting God. And listen, you can write this down. My best requires rest. My best requires rest. It's true for all of us. You're not wasting time when you're resting. So he gives us rest. He provides restoration. Look at this next verse, uh, 2 into 3. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He restores us. He revives us. He, he renew, renews us. He resets our hearts on him. He provides a direction. Notice that God provides next steps. And, and, and the sheep are not worried about the future. The sheep simply follow the good shepherd to the next step. God provides your next steps in life and in death. Look at what he says. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He guides me to live for his glory. That's what he's saying. The purpose of your life. He guides you to live for his glory. It, through the hard times, the difficult times, time of great pain, time of suffering, time of grief and loss, he allows you to give glory to him so that others might see his great Love and grace and purpose in your life. He directs us to live for his purpose. How does he do this? Well, it's through what you're doing. It's through worship with the body of Christ. It's through connecting with other believers and it's staying in his word. It's, it's serving others. It's multiplying your life, making disciples. That's the purpose of your life. And he guides you in paths of righteousness for his namesake, to his glory. And then look at this. He provides comfort. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Listen, friends, there's a long shadow of death over every one of our lives. I mean, we can try to enter into, you know, and, and, and pay for all kinds of diversions, but we can't escape it. We had, yet again, a family member die in our family this week. There will be more funerals to come this week and the next. But here's the thing. The shadow of death shows up in a lot of different ways in our lives. Some of you are walking through the shadow of death in terms of loss, uh, grief of a severed relationship. For some, Father's Day is not a joyful time. Some of you are walking through the shadow of debt. And it's got you stressed out in ways that you, that, it, that you really struggle. You're walking through maybe the shadow of death in the form of illness or discouragement. Death in all of its forms is loss. And loss brings about grief. Grief is a good thing. Fear is a bad thing. Grief leads you from one season to the next. Fear can be paralyzing. David says, even though I walk through the most challenging times of my life, I fear nothing. Fear not is the most popular, no, the most common, uh, and should be, I guess, most popular command in all of Scripture. 366 times in the Bible, someone said that's one for every day plus leap year. Fear not. And then it's always followed, almost always followed by, because what? I am with you. Friends, listen, we fear a lot of things, and we, we often fear things that never come true. There's, again, stress and anxiety. Think about it. If we were walk out to Northwest Highway, um, the shadow of a truck could come by and cast the shadow over us, and it would do us no harm. And the shadow is always bigger than the source. I think it's interesting that he calls it a shadow. If we learn to turn our backs on the shadow and instead turn... To the light, we'll experience peace in our lives. There's never a shadow without light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
You turn to him. You give him your life. You give him your concerns. But you must. You come in prayer. You see, you, you, you don't have to be fearful of anything because he's with you always. So he provides for us. He provides rest. He provides restoration, direction, comfort. And now finally he protects us. Verse 5, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This is what he's really saying is here. Let God be your defender. He's sitting at a meal as if casually sitting there before his enemies, enjoying the blessings of God. Another source of stress in our lives is conflict, which generally comes with other people, right? Some one who might be your enemy. I've had a hard time figuring out how do I, how do I talk? I don't know that I have enemies. Now, are there those who would seek maybe that, that, or hope harm for me? I think so. I think as a pastor, I think I'm always challenged. I think I, I'm under satanic attack all the time. But how do you deal with challenging people? How do you deal with rude people? I could argue you don't. You let God deal with them. You outlove them. You outgrace them. Or at some point, I've learned this, some people simply don't trust. They're challenged. They're just difficult people. Some people just have the kind of extra grace required for this person. And you learn that, and you love, and it challenges us to learn how to love well. And look at what he says here to close in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy will... Follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love this. God protects us in life, and he protects us in death. His righteousness covers us in life, but his grace, his righteousness covers us in death. He always leads us to the next step, and the next step is actually to be in his presence. L listen, the ultimate destination for every one of us is the good shepherd himself. We end up in his house forever. You know, we've been following each of these messages uh, through the series. We're going to do so today before we cl close in prayer um, with kind of a real-life application that I think can be inspiring for you. And as you seek to apply this in your own life, uh, I think that you can be blessed by the testimony of one who's walking through a challenging time in his life. Mario Alcala. Some of you know, and his wife Elizabeth are members of our church. They're sweet family. We've asked Mario to come and to um, just kind of share with us where he is right now in his life. And I want you to hear a fascinating testimony that I think is going to bless your life. Mario, come on over here. Sorry, I don't have a stool for you, bro. And um, microphone, guys, right here. Can we do that? Yes. Um, Mario, thank you. Thanks for coming. Is this working? There you go. And happy Father's Day. Thank you to you, by the way. Mario's an awesome father, has an incredible family. Tell us a little about your, about your family, about yourself, and then tell us uh, what you're walking through while you're up here so today. So I have a beautiful wife, two children. I um, <clears throat> was born in Dallas, moved, to, moved away to Oregon, came back 10 years later, and <clears throat> ended up back here in North Dallas, where I went to DBU, graduated, and now I'm working. And your dad, Tony, is a, He's a deacon, deacon here. here. Yes. Yep. So through him, kind of, you got connected here, right? Correct. Ultimately. Okay. And y'all been members how long? I think it's going on four years now. Yeah. Yeah. I know this church has meant a lot to you. More than I can even express. I it's may let you do that here in a moment. Tell us, uh, tell us what you're, <laughs> no, no, for real. As part of, I know part of the story. Um, what, um, tell us what you're walking through these days. Tell us your story. So I was diagnosed with uh, thyroid cancer in 2012. Yes. Um, I've had a thyroidectomy. I had radiation. I had another surgery to remove some lymph nodes that were, that were cancerous. I had another external radiation, which was, that was probably the hardest, the most painful of everything so far. And then <clears throat> about a year ago, they told me it spread to the other side of my neck. So I had another surgery, another radiation treatment. And about three months ago, they told me that it had, it actually has spread to my lungs now. So there is no cure for that. So the possibility of actually killing it is already, it's gone. So, so you, but you are going, you're going to go to MD Anderson in, in what, another 
Yes, I'm a few <coughs> months. So yes, I'm okay. being seen at MD Anderson, and three months ago they said yes, it's spread to your lungs, but it's not big enough to biopsy yet. So they have to have to wait six months and just let it grow, so they can biopsy it. So, uh, and I know we've we've talked about this, um, but tell us how are you, as you hear this psalm, you know David walking through the valley of the shadow of death. The shadow of death comes in a lot of forms, right? As we've talked about. How are you able to worship God through this, this valley, this shadow that you're walking through right now? How are you able to worship him? And uh, Yeah, how do, you, how, how, do you, uh, that, how do you have faith? In that word trust that you've been talking about, you know, I just trust in the Lord with all my heart. And when I came to the conclusion that I don't understand, that is when I really understood that he was in control of my life and I wasn't. And I'm just here hopefully being used by him to help people, like you said, make disciples. So I'm curious, um, I, and I know the faith of this man. You know, a lot of folks here struggle to, to have that kind of faith, I struggle to trust God. Um, so what, what would you say to those of us who are walking through challenging seasons of life? Um, how have you learned to trust the Lord? And, and what would you say is the, are the most important things that have helped you walk through this time? <clears throat> So 2911, Jeremiah comes to my, to my mind. That was our, uh, I guess, motto at DBU. And that's really how I've gone through a lot of this is just God has a plan for me. It's not my plan. Um, and I believe that the hope that I have isn't just for this earth. It's for eternity. And that's, that's what I look forward to. And I, that's what I have put my hope in. Tell me, I know the, the church has, sure enough, been such a gift. To you in what ways how have you seen the church Starting the body of christ at work just the, my connect group they have been amazing i mean they've helped out when my wife was in school full-time uh, they came they've delivered meals um they've planned wonderful things for us they've uh come over to our house we've all worshiped together and not just my connect group I, we went through marriage core which was awesome if you're not if you've never done marriage core do it yes. there you go david <laughs> <laughs> um yes. yeah I've met a group of people there who we still hang out with, and we've been done for, you know, a few months now. We've gone to the lake house and golfing, and yeah. it's been fun. So good. So the body of Christ has been such a source of strength for you. Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, so you're just going to continue to trust the Lord and worship him, knowing that he has a plan for you, a, a plan that you don't understand, something bigger. You trust him. He's God. He's the good shepherd. You're a sheep. And you're just trusting through this time. Yes, he's, uh, it's his plan, not mine. Yep. I'm going to have earthly healing or heavenly healing, so Amen. I'm not worried. Well, hey, let's do this. I want us to pray for Mario. We've done this before. We've prayed over him and prayed with him, but I'd love for you to pray. And, and I don't know if this makes you feel a little weird, but I, I, I bet every one of you all would love to come up and just hug him, and maybe put your hand on him and lay hands on him and pray over him. So if you would just, just uh, close your eyes and bow your heads, just bring your your hands towards us here in an act of faith as I'm able to place then my hands on him to pray for him. Would you join me? Lord, collectively as the body of Christ, uh, those who've come around him and served him and Elizabeth and their family in recent days, we now come as the body to pray over him. And God, we do pray for miraculous healing. We ask that if it be your will that you would intervene in ways that would confound the doctors and every person involved. Lord, we ask that you would do that. We know that you can in the name of Jesus to bring healing. Lord, if your plan is for him to glorify you in some other way, we, we, we lay that at your feet, trusting you, the good shepherd. Thank you for Mario's faith, how inspiring it is for everyone who knows him, for the witness he's bringing to those longtime friends in his life who've seen the dramatic change in his life, for those he knew in, in high school or in the Marine Corps, those whom he, he's worked with, his family in particular. Thank you for a godly father shepherding his family, showing them how to live for you. So we pray for the days to come that you'd bring peace, comfort, courage into his life. We pray for Elizabeth that you'd bring peace into her life as well as we trust you, the good shepherd. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Hey, let's thank Mario for coming and sharing with us. Thanks, bro.
I'm going to close our time. And, you know, this, this psalm is such a beautiful psalm. So much more to say about it. It's such a beautiful picture of God's provision and his protection, isn't it? You can trust him, friends. That's the point today. You truly can trust him with your life. It's a beautiful picture, but you know what? In the Bible, there's a better one. Jesus said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Christ, the good shepherd, has already come. He's already laid down his life to provide forgiveness, eternal life, soulful rest into your life. He's given his life for you. He's come to protect you from the wrath of God. He took on himself your sin so that you might be forgiven and live forgiven. Isaiah 53, 6, perhaps you know it. All we like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Praise be to God for a good shepherd who's already laid down his life for us so that we can give our life to him. That's all that's left, our response to say yes to him. And I love what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 25. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. Let's pray together. Friend, what, what anxiety, stress do you need to bring to him? As you've heard this message, you know, you know what it is. Pinpoint uh, your, your stress, the source of your stress, and give it to him now. What are you worried about? Give it to him. If you've never received Christ and his grace, he died on the cross for you, my friend. Give him your life. Respond to him by trusting him with your soul. Lord, we give you our, our lives. We thank you that the call you've placed on our lives, all dads, moms, sons and daughters, single, married, young and old, is to turn to you, our good shepherd. We turn to you now. We give you our lives. You have provided all that we need. And you protect us. We can trust you, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people say, amen and amen. Hey, you smell like sheep this morning, and that's a good thing. And as we close our time, as we leave, uh, I'm going to just encourage you again. Right over here, out these doors, there's a place where you can come and respond. If you need prayer today, we'd love to pray over you. If you want to come and join the fellowship of this flock, Become a, a member as a sheep uh, with a good shepherd, our head, Jesus, the leader of our church. You can come and find someone over here. Some of you need to join the church today. Hey, let me, let me challenge you. Dads, lead the way. Lead the way. And if God's calling you to join this fellowship, if he's calling you to receive Christ, to be baptized, whatever it is, dad, be the leader, the provider, the protector of your family. All right? So let's all stand. You're dismissed. Go in the name of the Lord to serve him as sheep to the good shepherd. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.